everyone for uh, for coming to uh, GDP's book of uh, published book series talks. We have two series of talks, which is one is based around books that are in progress and ones that are based around books that are already published this year. So this is our way of celebrating both the authors and the works. So before we begin, I would like to begin by um, paying my sincere respects to the uh, Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations on whose lands we live and work. And if there are any elders present at the talk today, I also pay my respects to them. Our speaker today is Dr. Philip Slavisky, who is an ARC DECRA research fellow at the Alfred Deakin, you know, uh, at the Alfred Deakin Institute. Uh, as the Discovery <laughs> Research Fellow, thank you. Oh, you're, oh is, is it no longer the DECRA? No, DECRA's finished on Discovery now, thank you. Ah, Discovery Research Fellow. And Philip is also a historian of the Soviet period, specializing in Eastern European and German 20th century history. And uh, we get to listen to Philip's um, reflections on his latest book, Remaking Ukraine After World War II, The Clash of Local and Central Soviet Power, which was just published a few months ago this year uh, by Cambridge University Press. And this study examines Soviet Union's transition from war to peace, peace in quotations, in the long aftermath of the Second World War. So without further ado, I hand over to Philip. Thank you so much, Philip, for speaking to us today, especially um, at this time of year when, you know, lockdown fatigue and semester fatigue and you're still here. So thank you so much for that. Yeah. No, my pleasure, Yamini. Um, and I'm, uh, if you want to ask me something, just, just ask me uh, while I'm talking, it's okay. And we'll have a little side chat and I'll get back on track. Uh, this is the book, uh, Remaking Ukraine After World War II. Uh, the book emerged out of my out of my DECA, which began in 2014 or 2015. I was very lucky because I was in Russia and Ukraine around this time um, conducting archival research. Uh, but it was also the time of the Maidan Revolution or the Revolution of Dignity, uh, which whose, uh, I guess, origins could be traced very much to my historical period. So I was in an enviable position of writing a history based on archival sources, but whose consequences were playing out right in front of me on the streets in the uh, mass demonstrations and then, of course, in the military conflict between Russia and Ukraine on the border. Uh, so very, as you, I guess, lucky to be in that space. Uh, and that uh, space is reflected in the structure of the book. So the first few chapters of the book look at the very difficult problems of reconstructing a society that had been destroyed by a war, uh, a civilization, if you will, that had almost been destroyed by a war and occupation. Uh, in a period where the major problems of that war continued to unravel even after the war had ended, mass violence and mass hunger primarily. So I was writing about that um, based on archival research across Russia and Ukraine. Uh, and that's what's in the first few chapters. But then the last chapter traces the long consequences of the problems that I was dealing with into contemporary Ukraine. Uh, so it takes it right from the 1940s to the collapse of the Soviet Union in the 90s, and then to, I guess, the devastations um, in the current conflict between Russia and Ukraine in the Donbass. And I would not have been able to do that, I think. I would not have been able to see those connections had I not been there at the time um, when they were playing out in front of me. So the book straddles the historical and the contemporary, which is a bit different for me, um, but certainly uh, it's certainly interesting in that respect. And what's the book about? Uh, I didn't. Uh, I didn't mean to write this book. I went to uh, Russia and Ukraine uh, to write a history of the Soviet Union's transition from war to peace, not Ukraine's. Uh, the problem was is that when I was operating in the Central Archives in Moscow, I came across some fascinating documents that narrowed my focus. Um, a lot of people wrote to government figures in the Soviet Union. Uh, usually they wrote you know, millions of letters seeking help uh, because uh, local officials were squeezing them one way or another and they had no recourse uh, legally to deal with them. So they plead for help from uh, 
you know, any of the major Soviet political figures. And all of these letters are in the archives now and you can read them. Uh, most of them were never read or responded to, some were. Uh, and one that I came across was particularly striking. It was from a Ukrainian soldier of ethnic Polish origin uh, who'd returned to his village in Ukraine, central Ukraine, after the Second World War. And like so many others had come back to dust and ash because the villages had been destroyed by the Germans upon their retreat from Ukraine and what they called a scorched earth policy where they raised the ground completely and removed all the animal and human labor back to Germany in order to, uh, well, deal with their labor shortage, but also to remove the possibility of the Red Army using these people to their advantage in their advance as they went westward. Um, so some of the worst excess, well, not even excesses, this was policy, some of the worst um, instances of mass murder occur at this time in 1943, 1944. So when soldiers come back, hoping to come back home, many of them having not heard from their loved ones for a long time, many of them are confronted with this spectacle. Now, that's not uncommon. Uh, and the fact that letters spoke about this is quite uh, cruelly, it's, it's, it's no particularly, it doesn't attract much historical interest because it was widespread. What was particularly interesting about this was that the person complained <clears throat> not so much about the destruction of the village and the murder of his family, but that when he tried to come back and rebuild his house and the collective farm upon which the next to the village, the local authorities stopped him from doing so. And this didn't make any sense to me whatsoever because when soldiers returned, they were supposed to partake in this reconstruction. In fact, they were given resources where it was possible. Um, the Germans had eliminated so much of the basic agricultural infrastructure of the country. Soldiers were supposed to come back, put their shoulder to the wheel, rebuild farms, rebuild cities, rebuild villages. And they were being stopped in this instance. And that, it didn't make sense. And I just, I, I couldn't understand why. And for a couple of years, I continued sort of working in and out of archives across Russia and Ukraine to no avail until eventually I went to the village. Uh, uh, there were only a few people left there. It's about three hours west from Kiev. Um, and I went there <clears throat> by sort of bus train and there's a bit of a walk. It's a beautiful area of the world. Uh, it's this, this wooded lowland um, with you know, flowing rivers and incredibly green. It's also the site of uh, the 20th century's worst massacres. Uh, and as I went there, I bumped into the, the nephew of the soldier who'd written the letter. Uh, and, you know, we got to talking and I ended up staying there in the village for a little while and just meeting all sorts of people who were fascinated to know how some Australian historian knew the intimate um, personal details of their family history. Uh, so much so that after a couple of days, I got an invitation from the local head and police chief to come visit them for a chat. Uh, so I, um, you know, when you get an invitation to these places, it's not really an invitation. It's, you know, you have to go. So, you know, I got in the car and, and went to the local um, municipal building and uh, they were very polite and uh, came in and sort of they got me to sit down on the sort of big chair on the big table. And they said, we're so you know, happy to have a, a foreign historian who's interested in our work and lots of um, pleasantries and so forth. And then it sort of, sort of turned very quickly uh, in the other direction. And the police chief sort of looked me down and he said uh, specifically, why have you come here? And I understood sort of the, the tremor in his voice because what had been happening in recent years is that people had been seeking out, I guess, family histories of repression. Um, and in some cases, there are potential legal ramifications for this. Um, so people who are relatives of those who'd been repressed under the Soviet, um, in the Soviet period, had been finding evidence of this, of their wrongful um, imprisonment, of their wrongful execution, or the dispossession of their property, particularly, uh, and had been making legal claims in contemporary courts. And so there was a concern, I think, that I might have been one of these people, particularly because they thought that given my surname, I was probably Polish. And <laughs> there's a, a continuing tension there uh, between Ukraine and Poland. So 
there's a lot that going on. A lot of that was going on. And then I happened to explain over the next 20 minutes exactly what I was doing. And then the mood changed again because people became really interested that their local travails were being discussed at the highest levels of Soviet power in the immediate aftermath of the war, which they of which they weren't aware. So in a sense, I started operating then on a very local level, going back to Russia, to the central archives, going to work in Kiev and trying to work out exactly what had happened. Uh, and what had happened was, was this, which gets to the core of the book. Uh, during the Second World War in the Soviet Union, uh, the Soviet state only survived by devolving central control to local authorities to run their areas. Usually what's told of in sort of a Stalinist totalitarian system is that during the war, there's a great centralization of power and resources in order to fight the Germans. The opposite is the case. Uh, the central state um, took control of defense industries, of basic food uh, production, but otherwise everything else, people were expected to get by on their own. This came after a period of the 1930s that was marked by mass terror and the mass centralization of central, of, sorry, of control the murder of the, by the state of millions of its own citizens. Um, so that many people actually experienced the Second World War as a liberation. And we're talking about a liberation where you have uh, an occupation by a German force that was essentially brutally killing millions of them. So it's a very strange period. After the Second World War, when the Soviets win, the leadership seeks to claw back the control that had devolved to local authorities. Uh, this is a problem because what local authorities realize is that when they ran their local areas themselves, they actually did pretty well. They were able to balance the needs of providing for their own people and providing some food for the military very well. Otherwise, what they've done in the thirties is that they'd have to send all of their produce to the center, which would then be distributed. Now they were keeping it local. In most areas of the country, local authorities gave up this control. In some areas they didn't. And that's what happened in Kiev or Blast in the area that I'm talking about, a place of about a million and a half people. They didn't give it up. Now, they couldn't do that openly because they were agents, of, you know, they were local authorities of Soviet power. This was their job to enforce you know, Stalinist control. So they did it in an underhanded way. For instance, what had happened here, why the local authorities were stopping the uh, soldiers from rebuilding their village and farm was because during the war they'd taken that land and they'd appropriated it for other sources. Now they couldn't give it back to them because other people were using it and they were making money by selling agricultural produce that they were producing on that land. They were using that money to help rebuild their city. And they were using the food that was made on there to, re, um, to provide for workers who were engaged in urban industries. They were doing this across this entire area when they weren't allowed to anymore after the Second World War. The reason they did this, again, because it worked, but also because they were receiving no significant investment from central authorities to deal with continuing problems in their area, and that is the lack of food, the lack of reconstruction and continuing violence. In 1946 and 1947, a mass famine hits Ukraine after a drought. Central authorities seek to extract more and more food from the country to feed the rest of the country. So they extract food from Ukraine to feed the rest of the Soviet Union. They're doing this at a time when more and more people are starving. So the resistance to central to the reassertion of central control increases in some of these areas. That's why when these soldiers came back and they sought to rebuild their land, local authorities told them not to. And they also had to keep them quiet because if they went off talking and sending those letters to the Central Committee of Secretaries in Moscow, they might find out the whole thing. But how do they keep them quiet? They beat them, they arrest them, they threaten them. Every time they rebuild something, uh, they rebuild a school for their children. The local authorities will come and knock it down plank by plank. So if you could imagine that in the midst of a terrible famine in which another million people die, you have soldiers who'd returned to their area to rebuild their farm in order to produce food and their housing in order to be sheltered from the cold, local authorities are knocking it down and threatening them. I thought that this was a exceptional case 
uh, and that perhaps it had something to do with the fact that they were Polish. And remember, Ukrainian and Polish forces are fighting against it, one another in Western Ukraine in a massive insurgency at this time. But the more I looked in the local sources here, it became apparent to me that something else was going on, that this practice was in fact widespread across this entire area. And the reason why I only found out about this was because these particular peasants refused to submit to the local authorities like other ones did. They kept on fighting for years afterwards. And because they kept on fighting, eventually their case became known by superior authorities who launched investigation. When they investigated, um, they didn't come up with a great deal other than the fact that local authorities were acting illegally and they should be punished. When I investigated, it became apparent to me that they were um, refusing to return land and labour to central authorities across this entire area. And the way in which they were doing it was they were doctoring entire sets of reports, entire sets of um, land tenure documents where they would uh, fabricate land transfers to say that, you know, these peasants are no longer engaged in collective farm work on this area and they're giving up the land to the local authorities. And there are many of them, and they look like normal land transfers. This happened because the population losses in the war were so severe that sometimes farms couldn't be reconstructed because there weren't enough people. And so people would come together and say, okay, the local authorities can have this land, we'll move over here and so forth. But of course, in these cases, they were making them up. And these documents form the basic sort of land transfer dossiers in Moscow. And so when I went back to Moscow and I looked at them, I could see that these were forgeries in these areas. And it raised the important question, how many other forgeries were and how many people were being booted off their land in order to keep up this illegal practice. And it turns out that many of them were. So I think the book reveals something we didn't know about post-war history in Ukraine, uh, that it's not simply a scheme for, this, for keeping land, labor and food local, but that it tells us a lot about the problems of post-war Stalinism. Post-war Stalinism in the traditional historiography is the zenith of Stalinist control in the Soviet Union. Stalin's uncontested, you know, local authorities do what they're told, not really. There's a longer history of contestation of, for power between central and local authorities in the same political system. And here we have something more than contestation, we have outright resistance. Uh, outright resistance that is um, hidden under a veil of secrecy and forgery. And much of the book unpacks that process in this area. Uh, what's the biggest problem beyond that is that when the central authorities understood in some way what was happening and they punished the local authorities for what they had done and demanded that they offer uh, assistance to all of these people to re rebuild their farms, they didn't do anything about it. No one got punished. No assistance was offered. And that's really hard to understand because this was an order emanating from Moscow, from the Central Committee Secretaries, to the Republican level under Khrushchev in Ukraine, and then at the local. And nothing happened. And again, this, was just, this, this, this is so uncommon in this era. It's not what happened, generally. And again, I went back there to try and find out what, what was happening and what was happening was that the local authorities basically said, yep, we'll do all these things, that's no problem. And then when they uh, were supposed to sort of punish people and give assistance, they dispersed the entire sort of corrupt network in which they were engaged. So there were about 112 people across different areas that were all engaged in this practice of taking land and keeping it and committing violence against these people. And they just dispersed them. They sent them to different areas of the country one by one into different positions, you know, into all sorts of, you know, government agencies and whatever. And so when central authorities came a little while later to demand the arrest of these people, they said, well, they're gone. You know, they've taken up different positions elsewhere. And this, in fact, was symptomatic of a bigger issue that was occurring at the time of local elites emerging after the Second World War to establish their fiefdoms within Stalinism in ways that, um, centralised control and sort of profit-making in the area and establish an independence from the centre at the same time. 
And if you can imagine this is happening in different areas across the entire Soviet Union, but it's happening in such extremities here. And we didn't know that this was happening to that extent either. So the book in revealing the secret and corrupt practices of land theft uh, touches on a much bigger issue of how this incredibly repressive system actually worked. Uh, how it worked in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War and how it is so far from the traditional understanding of how Stalinism operated. So um, as one of my reviewers said, the, the book opens a small window from a local case study onto a much bigger unknown problem that shakes the foundations of our understanding of post-war Stalinism. Um, there's a lot else going on in the book. Uh, I guess that's just the core of it. The, I guess what I'll talk about now just for about five or 10 minutes is how I bring that historical into the contemporary. And so when local authorities behave this way to areas, and we're talking about numerous thousands of people, they set them on paths of economic destitution for decades to come. So what they would do is that they'd stop them from being able to make a living themselves by limiting their access to land. Uh, that overtaxed them, seeking to remove them from their, from where they were staying. So in the place that I'm talking about in Ukraine, in Raska, local authorities put pressure on these people because they wanted them to leave the area so they could turn it into something else. They wouldn't leave. They sent the police in to eject them. They wouldn't go. Now, when the central authorities became aware of this at the end of the 1940s, even though they didn't provide assistance as such to these people, they weren't allowed to go in there and kick them out anymore. So what they did was that they cut off economic support to the area instead. The people stayed and tried to make do, and they did for the next 20 or 30 years. Uh, the problem is if you look at almost a, a, you know, a demographic map of this area in terms of you know, economic success, you'd see a big dip in this particular area and everything else rising up all the other areas in the region, all the other towns getting better and better, getting more successful. And this one kept on, you know, sort of dipping, dipping south. And that was a, that was a properly intentional policy. Uh, and so the economic destitution of these areas continues for decades. Uh, so much so that even at the collapse of the Soviet Union in the nineties, there was a marked difference between these areas and others. What about the people? In 1943, when the Germans were uh, evacuating from Ukraine uh, under pressure from the Red Army's advance, I mentioned earlier they instituted a scorched earth policy. In this particular um, village of Raska, they uh, burnt it to the ground and killed 613 people who lived there, mostly women, children, and the elderly. They were doing this across, across Ukraine at the time. Uh, there was one, there were about two or three survivors, um, only one of whom is, is still alive today. It's a woman in her late 80s who lives in the village, who not spoken about it publicly earlier, but who after sort of meeting me over the course of a couple of years wanted to talk to me about it and make a recording. So I did with her. And what's fascinating is not just her recollections of the massacre, which I talk about in the book, that correspond to archival accounts, but add much more color. Um, but her recollections of what happens afterwards about this broader battle between Soviet authority, the local authorities and the people. And it was funny. Um, well, it's not funny, it was a terrible sort of interview, but funny in a sense that uh, I asked her why she thought that um, collaborators who'd worked for the Germans and participated in the killing of uh, her relatives were able to find uh, positions of power in the Soviet regime afterwards. Most people uh, would imagine, and there's a lot of work on this, but when the Soviets came back through, they, you know, they searched for people who'd worked for the Germans, collaborators, uh, dealt with them and so forth. And it was very interesting because I said there was one particular, there was a policeman, you know, who worked for both regimes and people seemed to know about this and no one did anything about it. It seems to be quite an anomaly. And I said there was another woman, his mother, who seemed to take up powerful positions afterwards, even though everyone knew that she'd been a collaborator as well. And when I spoke to the local police head, unofficially, 
when I asked him about these two, he made this um, signal to me. He said, uh, if you can see it. it, which means in Ukrainian, they used to walk together, which means they were lovers. Uh, and there are little things like that that you get on the local level that you can't get in central archives. Uh, so the book, methodology, uh, so the methodology of the work as well is, is traversing not only the historical and the contemporary, but the central and the local, thousands of kilometers apart in different, uh, with different sources. Uh, where does it, what does it mean for today uh, in this place? Uh, there's a current war between Russia and Ukraine played out in Donbass. If you're in Kiev, you'd hardly know it if not for the um, irregular mobilizations of troops on the, on the streets that are going east or coming home. In this particular area, we're talking about people who are ethnic Poles living next to ethnic Ukrainians who, at least in this area, celebrate the uh, Ukrainian nationalist forces that were instrumental in battling the Soviets, but also in murdering Poles who lived in this area. So you've got ethnic Poles living next door to people who celebrate those who killed them, their, their uh, parents and their grandparents. And you'd think that this would be a cause for tension, but not really. Um, when I was there, I was invited to attend commemorations both for the uh, Poles who've been killed, uh, but also for the Ukrainians who've been killed by Soviet forces. And I asked my people, I said, does it bother you to go and celebrate or commemorate the death of people who are responsible for the murder of your grandparents? And they said, yes, it does bother us, but we do it. And they explained to me that what was central and what had been really important to keeping them alive in this area for hundreds of years was their capacity to be good neighbors and to understand the complexities of the past as difficult as it might be in the contemporary. And so this last chapter of the book also talks about this as a coping mechanism for historical wrongs beyond Ukraine, particularly for dealing with the legacies of violence um, and shining light on the capacities of the, I guess, regional areas to deal with problems that are caused by the cities and also the contemporary war. It's a big issue to end on, um, it's 12.33. Uh, but again, in a literature that's fundamentally obsessed with understanding how historical problems cause contemporary tensions, it's one of the few interesting examples of how deep historical problems can be a cause for understanding how people come together, not in peace, but in a way in which understands that in order to live peaceably in the present, you need to be much more flexible about the past. And it's a very hard lesson to sort of digest when you know what's happened in that terrible past. But these people are incredibly courageous, morally and intellectually. You know. uh, there's a lot more I could say, but I'd rather talk to you because I think what I tried to do is raise a few issues that you all might be concerned within your own research about the legacies of violence um, and so forth. So if you want to ask me questions or talk about them, please go ahead. Thank you so much, Philip. I've had the honor of speak, uh, hearing you speak before and I really, this talk made me recall how Selborne you managed to hold an audience with a very moving account, always a very emotionally moving account of, um, of Soviet histories and uh, how hunger, malnutrition, and land compose the core of nationalist part. It made me really think of Ben Siegel's book. You might be familiar yeah. with Ben Siegel's book on Hungry Nation, which talks about similar issues yeah. in India and about yeah. how the contested meanings of nation and nation making through food, hunger, and land. So thank you so much for this extraordinary account. It's a very, I mean, it's really motivated me to actually go and go and read your book now. Yeah. So I'll throw open the the, the you mean you haven't question. read it yet? Hey? You haven't <laughs> read it yet? <laughs> your, 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 your talk has met my appetite. Don't worry, Philip. <laughs> Absolutely. So, throw open the, the floor for questions for Philip. 
I noticed that Isan had a question in the chat, but maybe that's disappeared. If, if you want to ask, oh, J Jerry, you, do you want to go first? And yeah, then, yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Philip. I hope you can hear me. Sometimes this doesn't work so well. Um, oh, I can hear you fine. That's good. Fantastic talk and uh, important in so many ways, I, I think. Um, could just, just to come on that last hard point that you raised about the flexibility, what, what's that, could you just reflect a bit more on, on that, um, being flexible about the past? And I suppose one question I'd ask is, does that imply kind of suppressing or overlooking or being quiet about aspects of the past? You know, I understand you're talking about at the local level, yeah. But, yeah. but so how does that model work in real terms? Does that mean that, yeah, you don't, you don't yeah. talk about things? Does it mean that, um, yeah, the, so there's, so there's that's, information. Hmm. That's Go a really ahead. good. That's a really good question because I mean, so much of the literature sort of criticizes silence as hiding innuendo and repressing historical memories that can sort of burst out a later time. But silence operates in different ways, and you know, not the way they explained it to me was, uh, you know, the war was a terrible time where no one was really sure what was right and wrong. If you could imagine that in this time, a lot of people are killing each other. They've got, they're on different sides and those tried sides change at different times. And so it's, it's a way of understanding moral culpability as a shared problem, um, rather than allocating it simply to perpetrators who can become victims the next day. And it's really emerging from this terrible period and so few people would have such a sophisticated approach to that time. And we're talking about largely uneducated rural folk. But what makes them have it, if you look at how people like that have survived across different regimes in these areas when they've been minorities, it's been by navigating the different demands of identity, whether it be ethnic or national and finding ways to survive, keep true to their cultural norms, but at the same time, in, at least in their forward exterior facing, um, you know, identities to the state and to their neighbors of appearing in a way that's cooperative. And so, you know, someone might say, well, that's not being true to the memory of the people who, who were killed. And we'll say it actually is because they, were, they survived for the same way for a long time before they'd been killed by other people. So it's, it's about silence, and it's about almost a division between who you are out there and who you are at home and understanding the difference between, and it's in these places, that's, that's how people had survived for a long time. Um, and they're continuing the practice under a new regime. It was particularly hard in 2015 when the, you know, uh, sorry, the Yushchenko government came in and started to talk about Poles as historical enemies of Ukraine um, in a way that made ethnic Poles who'd been living in Ukraine for hundreds of years uncomfortable. And so it's changed a little bit now with the new regime, but these things go up and down in, in Ukrainian and Russian history. It depends who's in power and what the, the you know, the, uh, the, the policies are at the time. Um, but, you know, tracing these people from, you know, this period in, you know, the forties and before to today is, is, is an example of how, you know, people survive in the most incredibly difficult times and the different mechanisms that they use to do so. Yeah. yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. Thanks for that, Jerry. Um, James? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Philip. I just want to build on um, something that well, you've said, but also that Jerry said. Sorry, I just want to get rid of my hand. Um, which is on uh, what you described, where you have groups of people who are living together who don't who, who have a history of violence against each other and uh and how they might as you described uh be able to rationalize living together and even participating in events which involve their own persecution historically the, I, I'll, I'll try to find it for you there's a, a, a cambodian anthropologist who wrote about this concept called basque bat which is ptsd in the context of genocide, post-genocide Cambodia, and it's specifically about the topic of uh, people who have to live together, uh, yeah. neighbours, one neighbour was responsible for the massacre of the family and the other person's a victim and how uh, they have to live together to, um, uh, to well, just 
continue going going forward and the psychological effects that that has and, and the various treatments they have in Cambodia for people in that situation. So I'll try to find that one for you because it may, if you're continuing on this area, it might be interesting. Yeah. Um, but the, also in the Middle East, they talk a lot about conviviality in this situation where people don't necessarily have to like each other to live next yeah. to each other, but that they, I think it comes from Bourdieu. I'm not a big fan of introducing Bourdieu into Middle Eastern um, yeah. scenarios, but that is, uh, I think it comes from there. I see it used a lot, but the point that you're getting to about Ukraine and Polish, you know, Poland suddenly becoming the enemy after a, a leader says that they're an enemy is that these underlying issues suddenly become problems uh, when there are political entrepreneurs who see them as a point where they can yeah. stir people up. And, yeah. and sometimes it's arbitrary, sometimes it isn't. Um, and this seems to be a, a common thing in the Middle East and also some areas of the post-Soviet Soviet space where, like, we're seeing in the Armenia-Azerbaijan example, uh, not so long ago they were, like, they were friendly neighbours with each other who suddenly turned on each other. And then it's also now put into this ancient hatreds view. So um, I think that your work is great and there's some interesting... Uh, contrast comparative examples if you ever want to get in there. I just, it's not really a question. I just am thinking out loud in response to what you've said. And I look forward to reading it and also uh, your forthcoming book as well. Thanks, Philip. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, thanks, James. And I think, uh, I mean, part of what I was talking about there, particularly in the last chapter, is an invitation to um, a, a broader context and comparisons with other places because I don't think this is limited to, uh, to this part of the world. It's coloured certainly by these specific examples in history, but uh, the, you know, so often, particularly in, in this place, um, academics, elites, are almost part of a cultural industry that um, work on uh, historical tensions as a way of understanding the present. Uh, so few of them go out to these areas to try and live with people to understand how they manage these tensions. It's a top-down approach and it suits the political narratives that these people are trying to pursue anyway. Uh, you know, how do you, how do you live with people who, uh, whose histories are sort of diametrically opposed to yours? Um, you know, I sat through, you know, the singing of songs, uh, you know, national songs about, fighting the Soviets. Now, um, while, you know, battling the Soviets um, while celebrating the contemporary war against Russia makes sense. I mean, this is what, this is what's so, you know, prominent people drawing that historical trajectory of resisting foreign intervention in Ukraine. Uh, the problem is, though, is that, you know, people weren't just fighting the Soviets, they were killing a lot of other people at the same time in order to create this image of an ethnically pure Ukraine um, at, the, at, at the time and what happens now how do you sort of de delineate between those you know the, these very multifaceted identities of your historical heroes and so these are huge issues not only in Ukraine but elsewhere um, you know in the 90s when the Soviet Union fell apart particularly in the in, in the Baltic states uh, anti-Soviet resistance from their fighters against the, in the second world war became the the, the nation building narrative entirely of this period but no one talked about the fact that they were collaborating with the germans um you know because if you talk about that and suddenly building the nation on this basis becomes much more problematic so again much bigger issue i think that's beyond these areas but something that i find i find particularly fascinating um in understanding you know and all a much older practice that predates the modern period how do you how do people live with one another when their histories are so antagonistic and when they really don't like each other. Thank you, um, Philip. Thanks, James, for your question. We have a few more questions. So we'll go with Mariana first and then Anastasia. Thanks, Mariana. Thanks, Philip. Um, I really enjoyed the way you persevered with detail and complexity um, and I suppose, and, and, you know, both in terms of your method, that thing of archives and then the ethnographic sort of talking to the people and the tensions that that raised, I think that that in itself is really interesting. Um, and of course, you know, if you had come across different types of people, um, you may have got, again, complexity 
with you know different types of problems partly because you persevered with that and I think there is uh, very strongly and um, Slavoj Žižek the psychoanalytic theorist talks about this when we look at history we really love ret- to put order retrospectively from our what we know now and so he actually talks about the tension between that kind of um, historiography where you want order and you want things to go in a nice kind of linear chronological fashion. But what, and he compares that to what's happening at the time, which is I think what you've really captured, which is an open history. You don't know what's going to be the outcome and people are playing these various roles at the time of um, huge kind of immediate urgencies and and so forth and trying to survive, no doubt. So that was the thing that I think that to write a history that maintains the openness of people could go one way or the other and we don't know and there's various problems I think is a great achievement well done thank thank you Mariana Um, and and I think as you say um, you know these and the bit about silence uh, you know happen all over the place I mean even here in our non-post-colonial nation um, and and the various points at which indigenous voices were heard or not heard or or silent and so forth. So, and in order to survive, so I think it's all that thing of silence and unpacking that is a, you know has huge potential for in other parts of the world. It wasn't a question. It was just sort of a thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Mariana. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yamini, are you, are you? I can't. You're a mute, Yamini. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. I just said thank you so much, Mariana and Anastasia. Please um, ask your question. Sorry, I was on mute. I didn't even. Um, I just wanted to, to say thank you uh, as well, as well for, for, for your presentation. Uh, I'm a PhD student and I'm from completely different field. I'm from education, but because as you can hear from my accent, I come from, uh, from Russia. So it's a very interesting topic for me. And it was fascinating for me to, to listen to another perspective because uh, as you might know, so the history, how it, it's taught in, uh, in different parts of the world, it varies. So it was really interesting. And my question is probably it's not exactly about this topic, but just your opinion. How do you think, how did it happen that so people, different nations that used to live in one country because and Poland, and uh, actually, I'm not sure about Poland. <laughs> so anyway, Ukraine and Russia, they used to be one country, the Soviet Union. How did it happen and why that people started basically hate each other? Um, it, it's an interesting, I, I'll go back to, um, so to, I'll go back to the 1920s. Uh, so, uh, the relationship between Russia and Ukraine is historically fraught, but you're right. I mean, it's 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 generally a history of people who are very similar, um, but who have different cultural trajectories. I, that's how I'd put it. So um, when the Soviets came to power after the revolution, they were intent on building a multinational empire. They were the world's first decolonizers, and I tell this to my colleagues who are sort of decolonize, you know, who work on decolonization. So the, the question was, how do you save the old Russian empire? Uh, and their answer with themselves in control in the center, the answer was to provide a path to independence for all the smaller nations that provided part of this within a Soviet structure. So Ukraine, Belarus, Poland, the Caucasus Republic, all these things, they become individual nations within a broader Soviet framework. So they could live their own lives, they could make their own laws, but generally they'd be part of this broader structure. That was the promise. But of course, 
quickly soon it became clear that their idea of a multinational empire was that they made all the decisions and everyone else did what they said. Um, so guys like this that were part of the Ukrainian government, uh, they were committed to real independence within a Soviet structure, fought for it, uh, and they were killed in their hundreds of thousands in the purges in the 1930s as the Soviet state clamped down its control. So it's not so much a problem between Russia and Ukraine, but a problem historically between central power, usually centralised in Moscow, um, and the peripheries, including Ukraine. Um, so there's a long history of antagonism, murder, uh, mass killing here uh, that come to a head also in the Second World War. So the, the general Russian educational approach to the Second World War is that it's a Soviet victory led by Russia, um, defeating fascism. In some ways, that's true. In other ways, it hides the com deep complexities of the ethnic and national divisions that fought this war, including the fact that, you know, 8 million Ukrainians are killed in it. Many of them suffer oppressions thereafter uh, on, at the hands of the state as well. So, yes, you're right that it seems like um, people who used to live together now are fighting. But a closer look at their history would see that these people had been antagonistic and had been engaged in different forms of conflict for a very long time. And different types of repression had pushed it under the rug for a long time. Now it's bubbling up. I guess that, that would be my answer to your question. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Do we have any more questions? Ifan, I think you might have, I think you raised a question in the chat earlier. Do you wanna? Yeah, I want some more, <laughs> one more question. Yeah. Uh, where can I buy oh, the book? Question. Okay. <laughs> Oh, don't, don't, don't buy it. Just get on the Deakin Library and you can read it online. <laughs> oh, okay. Good. I'm Thanks. just, you're a poor PhD student. I can't ask you to buy the book. <laughs> so, yeah. my, question, my question is simple. You talk about rotten people. You Who just read the first this? paragraph, you son, that's all. Yeah, yeah. Who, yeah, I didn't read the book. I'm not pretending. So who are these people? Who caused them? as such and why? Uh, when central authorities ask the local ones, what are you doing in this area? Why on earth are you stopping local people from rebuilding their areas? The local authorities said to Moscow, they're not even, don't even worry about it. They're not even real farmers, okay? They're, you know, they're not trustworthy. They're just downright rotten. And so my book starts with the line, this is a history of rotten people in inverted commas. Uh, so it's people whose characters were assassinated by the by authorities who were um, oppressing them, and you know, you know, um, you quite see that everywhere, really, not just in in Ukraine. Um, but what made them rotten, and why it's such a fascinating word in 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 in, in Russian. Or, or, or he, he, well, he was in Ukraine, but he said in, in Russian because he was talking to Moscow. So. And Anastasia might know this, Razni So it can mean all sorts of different things in this context and in the sort of the, of the 40s, that's what it meant. He said, they're, they're rotten, they're not Soviet, they're rotten and they're untrustworthy. So their complaints that they're made against us are unfounded. But of course, when the Soviet leadership sends their own people out to investigate in the center, they give an absolutely opposite opinion. They say these people are indeed trustworthy and their complaints are legitimate. And so you have a strange alliance between Moscow and this little village against the local authorities between. Um, and that's what allows them the official victory to win. But of course, when Moscow loses interest, who's left? It's the local authorities and they win the day. Um, so that's why they're wrong. Thanks, Philip. Can I jump in with a question as well? Yep. So this might be a bit of a pedantic kind of question, but I I, I was curious from, from the outset, actually. So this whole issue of um, sustenance and land reforms being centered around very fraught and volatile identity politics is something that I'm, I was really interested yeah. in because I'm very familiar with these sorts of themes coming from India, right? But what has ended up happening is that there's an, at least in the context of India, there's a really serious, complete, uh, a, a massive gap, a 
complete gap uh, with, with regards to discussion. And centrally focused around identity politics. So, sorry, Yamini, you're See, breaking up. You're breaking up. I can't. I can't hear you. Oh, can maybe you hear me take now? a video. Take your video off. I think that will work. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's better. Okay. Yeah. Is it? Is it? Is it any better now? Yes. Yes. Okay. So no, I was just. I was just going to say that this whole issue of sustenance and food and land reforms being centered on identity politics is one that I'm familiar with in, like, and very interested in as well. Um, so, but I was, but in the context of India, I was wondering whether this is this finds parallels in in the context of Ukraine. What kind of, you know, I mean, is there any discussion around how climatic tra challenges or environmental challenges, given its geophysical location, what sort of, in in what ways that might shape the contours of um, of food yeah. politics and, and and the links with nationalist politics? Yeah. Or with, so my, or with land reforms? So my, my I just started a um, uh, discovery project on the last Soviet famine in 1946 and 1947. And that emerges fundamentally mm. from a, a once in a generation drought in 1946. Mm -hmm. um, there was a short story, massive drought. The uh, harvest failed. The Soviet regime got, they panicked and they instituted uh, a severe uh, requisitioning policy more than usual to take as much food out from Ukraine as possible to feed the rest mm. of the Soviet Union. Mm. This led to at least a million people dead, more depending on how you calculate excess mortality. So that where the, the project looks at the intersection of um, a drought caused by climactic changes, uh, government decision-making yeah. and famine, food crisis. Maybe. So, so in, in a contemporary sense, it's, it doesn't apply to Ukraine because the collapse of the Soviet Union collapsed the agricultural sector. Mm -hmm. um, but then, uh, in the middle years of the 20th century, it was absolutely central. And that famine was central to eviscerating the entire agricultural economy and the rural space. So what mm -hmm. happened was that millions and millions of people by the end of the 1940s left the countryside, legally and illegally, to become urbanites because it was the only way in which they could climb that Soviet social ladder and protect themselves from the vagaries of, um, of uh, agricultural failure. Yeah. So that's that's what that's what the the, the next the, no the third not the next book the book after that will be on. Um, uh, but it's a it's a pressing issue and the and the claim we made to the ARC was no one's written about this. Yeah. Um, and given how pressing it is, particularly today, we have ever intensifying and recurring famines in developing countries, it would make sense to have the last test case in you know, European history where you've got mass death as a way to better understand what's happening. So, yeah, so it's, it's exciting. Um, yeah. But I can talk to you more about that as well, if you like. I would love to actually, because it's such a, I mean, last year, I, I mean, all the COVID pandemic, um, what lots of people didn't realize was a locust invasion, right? Like it was yeah, such yeah. a locust invasion that pretty much took over Northern Africa, most of South Asia, and destroyed crops mass scale on top of, you know, COVID. Of course, COVID took all the headlines. Um, but, but but there is such a gap in policy and, and where uh, nationalist discussions around food is so centered around identity, this becomes a really gaping hole. And I think your next project is going to be equal, amazing if you're going to be addressing this head on. Yeah, thank you. I'd love to talk about that later. Thank you. Do we have any, I think we have time for one last question. If there is one. Otherwise, it might be time to say a happy thank you, Philip. Thank you so oh, much pleasure. for such a generative and engaged discussion. This is this has been amazing, and I will be reading your book for sure. It's on my Christmas list. <laughs> thank you so much, Emily, and thanks for coming, guys. I, I appreciate it very much. Okay, take care. No, thank bye you bye. for your talk. It's always a pleasure to listen to you, and I mean it. Thank you, Emily. Bye bye. <laughs>